Okay, I think we can get started. Yeah, go ahead, Serena. Okay, well, welcome everyone to our um, debate program and tournament workshop. We're really excited that you guys were, are able to join us today. And yeah, I think today is going to be really informative, but exciting to share about all the things that have happened so far with an Able to Shine. Um, so to start off our mission, um, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, comprehensive programs for empowering youth, confidence, leadership, lights, camera, action. We help you shine, why wait in line? Our workshop agenda for today, um, I'm going to start off with giving a little opening speech, a little bit of information. We will talk about all the accomplishments and tournament awards from Able to Shine. After that, we'll have some student performances, an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions personally to the students. And then we'll give a little bit of a training philosophy, more Q&A talking about teacher and management, and then we'll end with also more questions. So plenty of opportunities for audience interaction. If you have any questions at all, we will be more than happy to answer them for you. So a little bit about me. Um, I am one of the debate coaches, speech and debate coaches for Able to Shine. I went to UCLA and then I went to Cal State Northridge where I got my bachelor and master's in communication studies. Um, very, very passionate about public speaking, speech and debate, as you can see from my bio below. Um, and I've taught at many schools, including Irvine Valley College, Harvard Westlake, Sierra Canyon, Cal State Northridge, um, and now I'm here. But what I want to emphasize is that if you read through my bio, you'll see that the most important thing to me about speech and debate is helping students develop a sense of confidence in, in themselves. I'm here because I want students to grow. And that's not just um, Coach Serena. It's not just me that wants that. I think I can speak for all of the debate teachers that I've had the pleasure of meeting, that every single debate teacher we have at Able to Shine, we are all national champions. <laughs> We've all coached national champions. But one thing we all share that I don't think every single institution shares is that we are all firm believers that this activity is life-changing. It's changed our lives and we also strongly believe that it can change your child's life. Um, case in point, Matt, our director of forensics, he's also here today. He finished helping with um, the Berkeley tournament and he's here and he's also had his fair share of accomplishments but I know he's also just as passionate about this activity and I'm really excited for him to be able to share more of that later. So I just want all of you to be assured and to know that we're all here because we're passionate about teaching, but we're also very passionate about how transforming this activity can be. On to our achievements. I'm super excited to say that in February this month at the 35th Stanford Invitational Speech and Debate Tournament, Carrie and Summer won a championship, meaning first overall in the novice level parliamentary debate. So that's one of our most amazing accomplishments. At the same tournament, Aaron received, at the same tournament, Aaron received the top fourth speaker award in Lincoln Douglas debate. Well done, Aaron. And Olivia won top 12 at the oratory speech tournament. So great job to both of you guys. These are very, this is a very competitive and prestigious tournament. So these accomplishments are incredible. We also have more people. Um, Olivia Ma placed top 12 in impromptu speaking in the novice category and original oratory. Oh, she placed in original oratory, top 12, and impromptu speaking. All right. and Serena, I think that was a typo. Uh, that's, oh. That should be, um, Sophie was the top 12 in impromptu. Oh, in Sophie, I'm so sorry. So Olivia Ma, original oratory, Sophie in impromptu. Thank you so much, Matt. I think I think that's actually from a previous tournament um, there, just, just so we're keeping oh, our- Actually, our for this guy's- so this, the, the following bunch of slides, just kind of like a listing of all the- Yeah, listing of before Stanford tournaments, yes. Uh, no, actually, sorry, uh, I, could, I made a little arrangement here. I think these are all the like uh, um, the results for the other um, uh, participants as well, right? So just if you okay. guys, Got it. sorry, just just want to make sure we're we're uh, we're being okay. clear. Thank thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thanks, for, thanks so much for hosting, Serena. This is great. There's just been so many awards that students are winning. It's kind of, it gets kind of hard to keep yeah. track of <laughs> who's winning what, which tournament. It's just a lot of awards all at once. So my apologies, but no worries. Hopefully the, ho the goal is to show just that we've had so many great accomplishments. Um, more than that, Sun and Lange got championship. They won eight out of 10 rounds, a huge accomplishment in parliamentary. Sun and Zhang also won three out of six rounds. In Lincoln Douglas, we've had Aaron He win top fourth speaker award, won three out of six rounds. Belina Zhao won three out of six rounds as well. Eric Zhu, three out of six rounds. Terry Chi, two out of six rounds. Barry Liu won one round. And Ryan Sun was able to even compete in open division, which is such an accomplishment in itself. So many incredible awards. Hopefully, we can help your student be also on this um, leadership board of awards. All right. So now that we've finished listing um, just all the amazing accomplishments our students have achieved, I think next up we have a little sharing time, a little Q&A sharing time. Our first student who is going to share their piece will be Summer. So Summer, are you ready? Are you there? Yeah, oh, hi. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Summer and I am a 10th grader and Carrie and I, Carrie was my partner in the, at the 35th Stanford Invitational and we did parliamentary novice. So as I said before, there's 10 rounds and every single round there's a topic. And Carrie, this is our first time debating together but she's a fantastic partner and I think we made a pretty good team. And so basically I'm just gonna give you a little bit of what our last final, final round was. Um, so this was like the final, like this was determined whether we'd get second place or whether we'd win. And Carrie basically debates first and Carrie, uh, Carrie talks first and then she talks last and I talk in the middle. And so my job basically is to um, have responses for everything that the other team says. So that's, that's pretty much my job. Um, <laughs> and I have to make sure to do that. And so I'm just gonna give you, give you like a little bit of what that speech sounded like. And uh, I'm first just gonna say like what they, their speech was and then I'm gonna talk about my own point. So this is basically just almost exactly what I said um, the day of the tournament. So, okay, so my opponent's first contention was that, oh, first actually, let me talk, tell you guys the topic. Oh my gosh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the topic was that individuals ought not to obey laws that they believe to be unjust. Um, that was the topic. And um, basically, Carrie and I, who's my partner, she's fantastic, by the way, she, um, we are on the side of the government, which basically means that we support whatever the topic says. And it doesn't matter, like, whether I personally believe in this topic or not, like, it's my job, pretty much, um, to just support it no matter what and find stuff on the internet that supports it and present it in a good way. So I'm basically going to talk about... Um, why it is, why we are supporting it in this speech. So my opponent's first contention was that um, if we do not follow this topic, it will, uh, if we follow this topic, it will set a precedent for chaos. When you disobey laws, there's gonna be violence, anarchy, and you know, just hurting a lot of people by just not obeying laws. And there's a reason why laws are there. However, I would like to respond with the fact that only after breaking laws can you be able to emerge as a better nation. And we do have examples for that as the government side. In countries such as South Asia, there were violent movements to stop colonialism and oppression. In Vietnam, in the Philippines, only after a revolution were they able to establish themselves as a government and restore their culture after centuries and centuries of Spanish oppression. That is why you should vote for the government because under the government side's side, individuals will be able to disobey laws that they find unjust, um, to be unjust, so that as a nation, we can emerge as a better, better nation. Um, and so that's basically a little bit of the speech. Basically, I just restate what they're talking about, and then I respond with my own. And yeah, that was basically just a little snippet of what we talked about. And, uh, yeah, that was our final round.
Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm looking for the participants right now. Uh, okay, sorry, I need to mute this guy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. No, okay. No. Well, I did have a question for Summer, actually. And uh, before we open it up, I do have one specifically. So could you help describe the whole experience? A lot of people here might not know how the tournament works or what it feels like to um, compete in one. So could you share a little bit about your whole experience? Yes, so basically, okay, so the nitty gritty of it is that there's 10 rounds in total and you're required to debate six rounds. So that basically means like um, Carrie and I, who's my partner, we had six rounds that we had to do. And depending on how many of you win of these six, it determines whether you move on to the elimination rounds. So there's 10 rounds in total if you're gonna, if you're planning on winning. And so, um, we won four out of those six rounds. We lost two of them, but we still ended up going to elimination rounds because that was four was enough to win. And oh, someone's asking me if how I spoke, that's, is that how fast you spoke at the actual tournament or did you speak faster? Okay, I actually spoke pretty much at that speed. My partner Carrie speaks a lot faster than I do, um, but honestly depends on really like how much you have to say or the emotion that you want to put into it. But continuing on, we won four of the six rounds and then we won every single round, every single elimination round after that. So that's why we only lost two rounds at the beginning and then we won every single one after that. And you have to win every single one, otherwise you lose. Um, and so basically every round there's a topic, you get to, um, you don't really get to pick what side you're on. Um, unless you're in the elimination rounds and then it's decided by coin flip. So it's really, really random um, what side you're on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, for the audience, I feel like there's a bunch of questions we have. Let's, we're gonna put the audience Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, I'm super excited. I think the students are also excited to answer. So go ahead and keep that in mind. And we will have some time at the end where you can ask questions individually, but Thank you so much, Summer. I think it's been amazing to see how passionate you are and hear about your success. So thank you so much for sharing. All right. Our next presenter is going to be Erin. Okay. Hello, my name is Erin. And today I will be talking about what my speech, about my speech on the negative side and affirmative side. And the topic is, States ought to ban lethal autonomous weapons. Well, what does lethal autonomous weapons mean? Lethal autonomous weapons means uh, the deadly autonomous weapons. These deadly autonomous weapons can kill without human consent. Humans can't tell what to do because it's all algorithm based. And there has been a lot of controversy about whether this should be allowed. And this is why this debate came to be. Now I'm going to be doing my affirmative speech. Then I'm going to be refuting my affirmative speech by uh, using my negative speech as well. So I'll start now. Do use technology and experts and ensure fast proliferation in arms racing. All men's are 17. A law does not require a specific military technology development path as technologies pervade the civilian sphere. Militaries make use. Research underway across countless university laboratories, commercial enterprises making use of the market to lower prices and shorter innovation cycles. Laws do not require exotic opponents in a clandestine matter. They are available to a wide range of actors. Less scrupulous actors will find development much easier. Crude laws could be put together by technology available today by non-state actors. Software effortlessly copied via computer network operations. Proliferation could occur via experts to extremist groups. Should, should one leading nation say go forward, others will follow suit. Development laws could trigger a destabilizing arms race. Laws are unique. Opacity accelerates arm racing and makes conflict de-escalation impossible. The opacity surrounding laws risk competition, difficult to credibly demonstrate capabilities. Different is software, not hardware, meaning verification will be incredibly difficult. Uncertainty about technology and application means significant uncertainties. Countries invest a lot due to fear of what others are developing. 
rules of engagement will be unknown, and the state could change the programming to worst-case scenarios by adversaries, making arms days much more likely. Uncertainty makes it harder for countries to come to agreements. Private information means both sides believe they are likely to win. The dispute becomes more likely to escalate. Continued development goes nuclear. Ma machine, machine speed ensures malfunctions escalate by dismantling checks that prevented Cold War escalation. Non-military incidents prove. And number two, conventional first strike. Laws incentivize first strike by reducing political and monetary costs. The perception of preemption capability destabilizes nuclear postures. And then number three, South China Sea. Deployment alone risks escalation of conventional conflicts of use or lose pressures. Essentially, what my affirmative speech is about is how if we don't ban laws, it will lead to an arm race that will actually lead to a nuclear war, per, per my evidence. And now I'm going to be refuting it with my negative evidence. Banning lethal autonomous weapons will actually will, banning lethal autonomous weapons will actually lead to another arms race. U.S. AI investments high now, but China will close the gap zones. Investments and leadership statements prove less than Carson 19. The U.S. military is focused on keeping pace and growing state investment from in AI from major powers such as China and Russia. China announced that they plan to be world leaders in AI by 2030. China firms spent 4.9 billion dollars on laws surpassing U.S. firms. China is expected more to invest more than 30 billion dollars to reach its goal. China, if we ban lethal autonomous weapons, China won't even stop producing lethal autonomous weapons. Congressional Research Service 20. If we ban lethal autonomous weapons, Ch China won't stop producing weapons because they have stated that they want to uh, they want to gain advantage over other countries. And to do that, laws have been much have been very effective at doing that. And they said they want to spend $30 billion on lethal Thomas weapons. This would in turn lead to China not following the laws. And since US is actually the US is very the US is very vulnerable to China, and the US very worries a lot about what China does. And if it doesn't know what China is doing, and if China isn't following the laws, US will invest too because they don't want to be left behind. Banning lead nuclear laws lead to impose on strict controls on AI applications, stifling development of an automated military. Efforts to ban laws could impose strict controls on AI applications that could be adapted for lethal use, stifling development of useful military or technology. Automated military decline leads to China to fill in. Shanahan has been clear about his desire to automate the American military. Where I, what he, he said, what I don't want to see is a future where adversaries have a fully an AI naval force and we do not. The US Defense Secretary have warned that Chinese technology may be more advanced than America's. The American military seems to go another level in 2020. So essentially what the negative side said is that if we ban lethal autonomous weapons, first of all, US and China will not follow the law. They have said they want to spend $30 billion in lethal autonomous weapons and that they won't, they won't ever stop. It is inevitable. And since US doesn't know what China is doing, it would also, it would also, it will also start developing weapons. And per my opponent's evidence, it says, it says that uh, arms race goes nuclear. Yeah. Th thank you for listening. Awesome job, Aaron. That was incredible. You spoke at such a fast pace. Um, for a lot of you who may not know about this particular event, it requires so much intense research. He was giving a lot of evidence. And it's just incredible to see children at such a young age talk about nuclear power, international affairs. I can't just help but think where Aaron is going to be in 10 years if he's talking about these things now. I don't know, like the next president, who knows? But amazing job, Aaron, that was incredible. All right. Um, well, our last speaker who's going to share is going to be Olivia. All right. Hi. Uh, All right, Olivia, give me one second so I can spotlight you. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Olivia. I'm in the eighth grade and in the Stanford, the 35th Stanford Invitational, I participated in the OO, I think it was the novice, novice or intermediate? Novice. Novice. Um, the OO novice section. So um, let's say basically what that means for OO is original oratory where you do well, you, how do I say this? You do research for like a certain subject or argument that you want to bring forward or advocate for, which is like one of the most common things that people will do. 
um, some people choose to do it with their more with their own examples, which is uh, or their own stories, which is what I did. Um, yeah, the maximum is 10 minutes you can speak for with a 30 um, second grace period, which means that you're allowed to go up to, you're technically allowed to go up to 10 minutes and 30 seconds, but it's frowned upon to do that. So 10 minutes should be the cutoff and a lot of judges consider eight minutes to be the minimum. Okay, so that's what I did and I got into semifinals, which is top 12 for that. Okay. So well, for my speech, it's called Light in the Darkness. Um, basically, I talked about what we can do during this, um, during COVID-19 to help others. I know unconventional because it's more typical for people to do something about world hunger or social norms like um, misogyny or things like that. Yeah, but I, I did something a bit different. Okay, so I'm gonna start now then. Light in the Darkness. January 20th, 2021. During the 46th US Presidential Inauguration Ceremony, Amanda Gorman, the National Youth Poet Laureate, began her poem with this. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? Throughout the tragic year of 2020, not only have we experienced the now widespread and well-known effects of the coronavirus, but we have also had to say our goodbyes to many heroes and icons that will forever remain in our hearts. 2020 was a year in which happiness was perpetually juxtaposed with heart-wrenching loss. As a 12 year old eighth grader, my life was also changed by a huge loss. No, it's not my hair. I'm not that old yet. No, it's not my smile. It's still as beautiful as ever. What 2020 took away from me was my first true love. Sorry, mother, but no, you're right up there too. This love I speak of is what I've devoted seven years of my life to, my everyday routine, my passion, my drive, figure skating. It's an arduous task putting the joy of figure skating into words. It's not just a mere sport, it's another state of being. When I glide on the ice, the blades of my boots ever so slightly leave behind precise incisions. When I spin on the ice, my hair is enveloped in the synchronous dance with the wind. When I skate fast and come to a sudden hockey stop, I can see the chips of ice levitating in the air. Ephemeral, yet gratifying. Figure skating allows me to become one with my surroundings. Before COVID-19, I skated 10 hours a week. Even on vacations in places where a rink was not accessible, you could still find me practicing. Yup, that kid you saw spinning and doing balancing drills, that wasn't Tai Chi, that was me. Point is, I love figure skating so much, I never thought there would come a day where I would not be able to skate anymore. However, COVID-19 ripped it away from me on March 13, 2020, the day that all skating rinks in the Bay Area were closed down until further notice. I didn't know what to do. How could I go on without skating? How could I keep up my level of progress? And when will I be able to get a clean and crisp double axle? It must have been what a certain someone felt like when Twitter was ripped away from him. He didn't do anything wrong. All he did was incite revolution and spread fake news. Okay, on second thought, he did deserve to lose those privileges. But what about me? What have I done? I got in touch with my coach who encouraged me to continue my off-ice training. That would at least help me retain my muscle memory and keep me in shape. But to be honest, without the facility, my coach by my side, and my other skating friends' collective optimism, it would not have been possible to move forward. I started to think, this is a privilege of mine. Not everyone is necessarily as fortunate as I am to have such a strong support group to get me through this tough time. 
What about the others who are stuck in this terrible situation, yet have no way out? How can I continue doing exercises, not only by myself, but also encourage other students to stay active? With strong support from my mother, I created a brand new online exercise channel, smack dab in the middle of COVID-19. I wanted to encourage more adolescents to do exercises with me. It's shelter in place, not shelter on couch. SIP doesn't give you an excuse to become a couch potato. Although we all know how easy that is and how much we all want to. Back to my story. Starting in May, I created my online Zoom workout group, and I even started to publish daily workout videos on social media. Every Sunday, I led four to 14 year olds to work out together through Zoom. But that wasn't just a place to work out. It was a community, a chance for us to get some social interaction during these hard times. It was widely welcomed by lots of families, likely because of my workout's attention to both physical and mental health. Now, eight months later, over 200 families from the East Coast, Midwest, and West Coast joined me for this group workout. I received lots of positive feedback from both parents and kids. Everything is arranged by myself, including workout program design, music selection, and even nutritional information sharing at the end of each session. I put a lot of thought and research into this event every week. And yeah, that's basically about five minutes of my speech. So um, in the second half of my speech, I got more philosophical and analytical about, oh, about what we can do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was an incredible speech. And I loved seeing how passionate you were about this particular topic. All right. So fantastic job. Um, now we're going to open it up for questions. If you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the chat so that we can see it. Um, or you can turn on your camera and raise your hand and we can also call on you as well. So either is okay. Does anyone have any questions for any specific? Oh, oh, Aaron, do you have a question? How long was your speech? Uh, my speech was about nine minutes and 30 seconds, which is like considered the sweet spot for the length. Okay. Great question, Aaron. Also questions can be for any of the speakers at all. So any of them. Summer, Aaron, Olivia, any questions for our three amazing presenters? Um, I think I can start off with a question. Um, I, I can tell that you guys put a lot of work into preparation, especially because you won in your event out of, you know, maybe like a hundred students or so. I know in OO, usually the one Olivia competed in, usually there's around a hundred students. So I'm curious to know how long all three of you guys prepared for the tournament and what you needed to do. So maybe like we can start off with Summer, Aaron, and then Olivia. Yeah, sure. So basically, so because what we did was a parliamentary debate, technically our coach, um, Matt, who's here, the director of forensics, he's super awesome. And he started coaching us for parliamentary, um, which I had like pretty much next to zero knowledge in, in October. And he was super great. Like he would teach us about um, different terms and he'd also have us do practice rounds and he'd also have us how to, like practice to prepare because in parliamentary, you only have 20 minutes on the internet and like, that's it. Like it's cheating if you are on the internet longer than that. Um, so he did a really good job of preparing us for that. So I guess technically we've been preparing for Parley since October. Awesome, thank you so much, Summer. Um, Aaron, what about you? So Reese is my teacher and uh, originally we did public forum. Public forum is another style of debate, but that's different from Lincoln Douglas because it has different topics and different time limits. So we switched to Lincoln Douglas because one of the public forum topics Reese didn't like. He said it was too complicated for us, which I could see because it was about 
a no first use policy, a global, um, it was a policy that prevented people from using nukes. Um, so we switched to Lincoln Douglas and we started Lincoln Douglas around, I would say November or December. I went to 0 for 6 in my first tournament because I was really bad. I, so I decided to take some, my mom made me take some private classes and go to more classes and I got, I got better and better. And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I spent like, um, for this topic, I spent around 15 hours preparing, no, like 10 hours preparing because I was writing my own stuff. And Reese was also giving us some, um, a lot of evidence, but I wrote my rebuttal cards. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, mom, for those extra classes that helped him win all those tournaments. Shout out to you too. All right. And then what about you, Olivia? Um, so for OO, I actually learned about it and written my own personal speech in May. It wasn't like, it wasn't that good. Um, and I kind of took a break from it until January of this year, actually. Um, I was told I was going to do the uh, do the tournament about a month prior and you know beginning of the year is always kind of busy so I didn't have that much time to prepare I had about like two weeks to do it um to write my speech and then you know mark tones and then just rehearse it a lot yeah Awesome. Olivia, we also have a second question for you from Aiden. Again, to the audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. But Aiden asked an, a really good question. He said, is the performance judge based on the content of the speech um, or the delivery of the speech? And if it's both, how exactly do you balance the two? Um, so the performance is based both on the writing and the deliverance. Um, I I, before I competed, I wasn't too sure about this. Oh, and for, uh, I forgot to do some, I forgot to thank Gary, who was um, my main coach for the original oratory. Um, so like I was reading some of the judges comments like a few days ago, and then some of them didn't give me as high placements because they thought my topic was kind of unconventional because I didn't advocate for like a specific topic um, but yeah, it just, it's judged on the content of the speech, like how you write it and how you deliver it. Like, it can't just be like a really blessed speech and, you know, does like, and then you could deliver it like the best person in the world, but you know, you still have to have good writing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olivia. Do we have any other questions from the audience? You can go ahead and put them inside the chat. like several questions have been answered in the chat too about the lo logistics of the events so i just uh, share my screen uh for guys for you guys information um for the judge, mm -hmm. uh, judging criteria here um those are the detail for your information both you know speaking technique and also the delivery and also the content serena we had a question earlier from if i may uh from brendan mm -hmm. Um, this is asking all three of our speakers, maybe we can start with um, Summer on this one. In preparation for the competition, which of your speeches were impromptu and which were prepared beforehand? And they're all in very different events, so they'll have very different answers. Yeah, hi. So um, because I am doing Parley, uh, we only have 20 minutes, Carrie and I, um, to prepare our entire uh, case. However, that basically means we're researching about what can we do to support the topic or not support the topic, depending on whether we're the affirmative or whether we are the negation. Um, so I would say that that is prepared. So like your arguments are all prepared. However, I guess you could say this is impromptu. If my opponent says something um, that supports their argument in my speech, I have to come up with something on the spot to say back to that. So like I said in my um, speech that I gave in the beginning, like I didn't really prepare that information. That information that I stated about South Asia, that was just information that I had that I thought of on the spot. So you could say that was impromptu. So I think Parley is a mix of both. Awesome, Summer, thank you. Erin, um, what about you? 
So for Lincoln Douglas, it's one person. So like what Carrie or what Summer said, the arguments are prepared beforehand, but the refu refutations or responding to opponents' points are mainly impromptu. You can think of what the opponents are saying beforehand before the debate starts, and you can write some blocks to that. Um, that's that's allowed, and you and that's what mostly I did. And most of the time, the arguments the opponent made were all the same. They're either about global warming or nuclear war, and I already had lots of evidence against that. So uh, mainly everything was prepared beforehand. But there was one time, the my last, my last, uh, my last debate. Someone mentioned something about disease. I didn't have much stuff against that, so I just had to say that nuclear war outweighed because nuclear war would, if we solve for nuclear war, we would also prevent for disease. That's also called an impactor. Uh, so basically, a uh, summarized everything is prepared except for the things that the opponent says. Awesome, thank you. And then Olivia. Um, for OO, you just write your entire speech beforehand. Like, um, there's no limitation. Like, I'm, I, yeah, I'm on mute. So, um, there's no limitation. Like, it's not like they give you a topic to write like 30 minutes before or something. Um, in most competitions, OO, you can really write about anything as long as it follows like the certain guidelines. Um, you can write about anything. You could write it six months before the tournament. That's all fine. So yeah, there's almost no impromptu. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So some events are prepared beforehand, but we do also have events that are a mixture of like impromptu, but also preparation. All right, we also do have another great question from Jordan and any of you three can answer this one, but Jordan asks, how do you maintain your focus? Um, focus as in like during like speaking or while Which, preparing. Whichever. I think maybe uh, both. Well, for me, for me, like the, um, the public speaking focus, like it's pretty easy to focus. I mean, you just speak for about like nine to 10 minutes and then done. So, so it's pretty easy to focus um, if you do OO. Um, Aaron. So the hardest part about focusing is the part before the, uh, the part before the debate. I get butterflies in my stomach and I, I had to take a lot of deep breaths and stuff. But once you actually get into the debate, you just go by the flow because everything's already prepared beforehand. And the only time you're like nervous if you don't have a response to the opponent's points. And yeah, that's basically all. So you don't really lose focus in the debate. All right, um, Cherry, did you have a question that you would like to ask? I think I see a little hand raised on the top corner. How did you prepare your speech? Whichever student, do any of the students want um, to respond? Um, I just, um, there's a pretty standard outline for some people who, for people who write OO speeches. But I didn't use it like uh, I think in January I was writing my high school application essay and then I just kind of based my OO off that except I extended it a lot. Yeah. So that's, pr that's pretty much what I based it off of. Um, it's how I prepared it. Yeah, and I, I did I rehearsed a lot like two days before <laughs> the tournament. Yeah, great question. I actually have, I see two um, similar questions in the chat. So, and you said, and you asked, how do nerves factor into the performance? And Boya asked, when you talk on stage, aren't you nervous? What makes you nervous? So I think this is a great question to address because some students or some ch children might be a little bit too scared. They might think they're too nervous to do this activity. Um, so I would love for one of our students to share about what they do with their nerves. Um, so for OO, one of my, one of the main things that people have a problem with, with public speaking is the fact that there's people staring at them. Um, but I think for OO, if you're not in the elimination rounds, there's like no one looking at you, except for like your fellow 
for the judge and like five other competitors. And this is actually easier on Zoom because if you're not a speaker or a judge, you just keep your camera turned off and you're muted. So it's honestly not that scary. Um, and it's the same thing with elimination rounds too. And one of the main things that makes me nervous is if I forget something, like one of my main points, like I forget to say something or I'm in the middle of um, a section and then I just forget my speech. But like, um, if you practice and rehearse a lot, then it, it helps. Um, Summer, I think I saw you unmute real quick. Did you want to also answer that? Yeah, um, I know that like Carrie and I were so nervous. Like on during finals when we were prepping, like every one minute we'd be like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. And I would say that like, it's not that being not nervous is what makes you win. Being nervous is what makes you win because that means that you care. And if you're like not nervous, like I don't wanna say there's something wrong, but like it's okay to be nervous because that just means that you care about what you're debating and you care that you wanna win, which is always a good thing. Like you don't always have to win, but you know, sometimes it's good to want to win. And so just like being nervous is like really normal. And we were so nervous. Like I can't, like we were so nervous that day. So it's totally okay. I love the way you answered that question. So parents, if your children are nervous, that is a sign to sign them up because that could be an indication of a winning child. Matt, did you also want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in. A couple of people were asking about Zoom. All of our students, I'd love to hear what their experience is like debating on Zoom, but all, our entire team was created post Zoom. Um, we think uh, we've been having a lot of discussions nationally as coaches. Um, that we will be keeping some Zoom tournaments because so many more students have been welcomed into the activity. Um, so we have a great coaching group that comes together. Um, we're working on our storytelling elementary school tournament now, and then we'll do middle school storytelling next. We have middle and high school public forum and Lincoln Douglas. Most of our tournaments are open to students um, that are sufficiently experienced to get a really good experience out of it. Um, Stanford and a couple other tournaments we, we were only going to take our top students to. This, is, this was the largest tournament in the, in the whole world of the year. Um, I think we counted six different countries came. We wanted to make sure that um, this was going to be a really positive experience for our kids, no matter whether they won or lost. We'll, I'll talk more about the philosophy in just a minute um, if they're, uh, once we're done with all the questions. So we, we took students that we knew from Able to Shine had the ability to, even if they were nervous, still learn and have fun. And I think uh, there's lots of questions about how to sign up, which is wonderful. I think Min and Ping will be uh, putting links to our signups in the chat. Uh, it is a really great program. Would you like, um, are there any yeah, other questions? Think, uh, Matt, maybe you can spend a few minutes in, in, in introducing the philosophy yes. all this stuff, you know, to the audience. Yeah. So I, I've been doing speech and debate. Um, like Serena, speech and debate is something I competed in as a student. Um, but then I've come back as a coach. I've coached for several programs. I was the head coach at the program in Ashland, Oregon for the last four years. We won state championships every year I coached um, as a team. Uh, we sent large groups to nationals. One of my students got second at nationals last year. I love speech and debate. Um, I also love teaching overseas. So I keep, you know, kind of coming back and forth between those two. But now, thanks to Zoom, we can do both. So Able to Shine to me is kind of the perfect program in a number of ways. We firmly believe that every young person has something really important to say. They just might not know how to say it in, in the right way yet. So we believe that you can learn critical thinking and communication skills. One of the first questions I ask students is, what's something that gets you really excited? What do you just love talking about? You know, and for youngsters, you know, it could be something like Legos. Some of them love engineering. It turns out everyone has something really great to say. And even more important, it feels so good to listen to that powerful voice others have. And our Able to Shine public speaking classes have done an amazing job of bringing this voice out in young people, um, mostly in the American born Chinese community. But now we have students from all over the world and from a whole variety of backgrounds talking about great things. We want to develop that whole child. Speech and debate tournaments are a crucible where we can kind of take all of those skills and put them into an individual round in front of a, a judge who we don't know. We don't know where they come from. We have a sense of their background. We know every one of them needs to be 
communicated with in a powerful and unique way. And that's something that we really saw our debaters doing a great job of there. For example, Aaron uh, and I were just talking about how much he slowed down to speak to this audience here, when normally you would be communicating um, probably quite a bit faster depending on the debate round. Our tournaments um, have been really successful in, in testing those skills. So what do we do in our, why do we do tournaments? Because, speaking for I'm sorry. Um, so we do tournaments because classes are really important. To, they help us learn skills and understanding of the world. But the tournaments are where we actually test those skills out and grow. So we don't focus on trying to win an individual tournament. We focus on how much can we experience and get out of this. And as a matter of fact, sometimes losing can be a really great experience. Remember Aaron showed earlier that, you know, he had that tough first tournament, but he came back from it. And that's what matters to me is how do we deal with losses and setbacks in life? Carrie and Summer lost two rounds in preliminaries. What Summer didn't tell you is they actually came back and defeated both of the teams that had beat them in earlier rounds, including in finals, beating the team that won second speaker in the whole tournament um, for their incredibly persuasive speaking skills. And we had adjusted and said, okay, on, on Saturday, we lost this round, why? Every night we're gonna work on it and we're gonna get better. And by Monday morning, we were ready to come back and we had leapfrogged ahead of the St. Mary's team and they won the tournament based on that. So there's so many benefits to speech and debate. Um, in the la last year, over half of the valedictorians at the high school I was working with were from the speech and debate team. Students are much more likely to get into college with speech and debate on their resume. We have a joke in the speech and debate world that the only job that more former speech and debate students do than being a lawyer is being a college admissions officer. So sometimes you can bring up your oratory or you know, your, your debate tournament when you're interviewing for a college or for a private high school or middle school, the odds are decent that the other person will have either done speech and debate or know all about it. Next slide, please, please. Um, go back one, thank you. So we work together as a team. Someone asked earlier, do we uh, register for tournaments as individuals or as teams? This is a team sport. Well, it is physically possible to enter one student alone. Um, and I have gone to tournaments alone. I was the only tournament student on my team that qualified for the Tournament of Champions one year, uh, for example. It's just not the same experience. We need to have that whole team support. So while we are very proud of Carrie and Summer's win, it was really a win for all of the students that were there. We had Anna and er um, Erica and Summer and Raymond and Mike all backing them up, giving them ideas, you know, what's happening in the world? How can you use this? Oh, this argument wasn't working for you. Here's what worked for me. In among our LD debaters, every round coming back discussing what arguments did you see? How can we adjust? We train as a team, we win as a team, sometimes we lose as a team, but most importantly, we grow as a team. Um, communications about other people, we need people to practice with. Um, and we spend a lot of our prep time do, giving each other feedback. Learning to give someone else feedback to actually teach something to someone else is the best way to grow. Uh, let's see, next one, please. Another big advantage to joining Able to Shine is especially uh, your, your school may have you know, some kind of a debate team and that's great, you should do that, but you should also come with us. And one reason is we make sure that every student is gonna, is gonna find a way to, to fit. Even in the team events, we set up teams, we try a couple of different teams out. For example, as Summer mentioned, this was her and Carrie's first time debating together. We've been trying kind of different you know, configurations to find each other's strengths. And it turns out that their styles were so different and so complementary at the same time um, that it really just it was exactly what our judges needed to see. And so we make sure that you have a good partner. Uh, I know for me as a student, um, my coach did not help find partners. The students had to do it on their own. It, it, it led to some pretty hurt feelings sometimes and actually was why I ended up joining Lincoln Douglas debate my senior year in high school um, because sometimes you know things happen, uh, events come up, someone gets sick. We make sure that your students find an event that works for them. Uh, we work together and really do the, do the great things. We also take care of the logistics. Anyone here who tried to sign up for Stanford knows that um, some tournaments have, have not only already have a lot of logistical barrier in terms of paperwork and other things, but have only made that worse during uh, the pandemic. 
the number of forms that were required back and forth. And then they kept sending, I think uh, Ping and I counted maybe 22 emails in the three days before Stanford with ever changing requirements. I love the people that run Stanford, but wow, it was pretty intense. And that's my job. You know, I've been, I've been running tournaments for years. I helped run the national tournament um, last year. I've run um, state level tournaments and national level tournaments. I pioneered moving ballots to being all online four years before the pandemic so that we could be actually giving electronic feedback. We used to have piles of ballots and papers and we would be reading them on the bus home and then they would get wet and you would lose them. And you know the coaches wanna see the feedback. Now all of that is in our electronic system. So we can all be reviewing the feedback together from our own homes. Uh, it's really a great activity for the pandemic and it's a great activity going forward when so many other sports and activities can't be safely done. Able to Shine Speech and Debate program is here for you. I think we're on our uh, penultimate slide here, Ping, one more. Yeah, this is so, one more. Yeah, so uh, just a quick kind of comparing us to other organizations. There's a lot of great speech and debate organizations out there. I wanna be very clear. This isn't about competing. I mean, we're all a community, we build each other up, but I, I think ours is, is the best, especially if you are newer to speech and debate. We have the right coaches that really support the student from the beginning. We are focused on a growth mindset. Our team is big enough that you're always going to be able to enter tournaments, but not so big that you're going to be isolated from other students or from adults. Uh, there's many program, wonderful programs um, that are just really large that can do great things in other ways, but you get the real support. My high school program, we had 100 kids and one coach. Uh, it wasn't until my senior year that I got personal coaching. Um, our, I think our, our boot camps have been between like four and 12 students, depending on the event. So we're really getting in there. I mean, every student is practicing every single time um, and really getting that feedback. We're, we don't go to as many tournaments as the, as the teams that are, you know, that have the fourth year competitors. Our students are still in their first year. We're going to about, each student should be going to about one tournament every uh, six weeks or so with us. Our team goes to about a tournament every three weeks, but uh, it is the right number of tournaments where you get the most out of speech and debate. You should not think that you can go to one tournament and win. You need to go to multiple tournaments, get that feedback and grow from it, but you also could do other activities uh, and focus on your school still. And we support that. As a matter of fact, I think during the tournament, at one point we took a homework break. I believe Summer had a calculus test. How did that end up going, uh, Summer? Good, it went good, great. Nice. So we knew we wanted to support her. We didn't want her to be stressed out. So, you know, we took a little calculus study time. It turns out it's the math I'm bad at. So she was explaining it to me again, that same principle that if you can explain something and teach it, you'll be even better. Um, so there are a number of state and national level tournaments. Stanford was, is kind of the crown jewel of what we call the national circuit. The top students at the national, at the national circuit tournaments will then be invited to a tournament of champions. We're not quite there yet. That's mostly for third and fourth year students. We're still in our first year, but we will 100% send, uh, send teams to the Tournament of Champions in a couple of years when our students are ready. I think that's what I have to say. I just wanted to give a huge credit to Ping um, and Min for really making this possible. It was a big risk they took transitioning from more of a class-based program to tournaments. You don't necessarily see the, the immediate reward, uh, but I think it's really paid off for our, especially for our students, but also it's just a pleasure to teach here. Thank you. Yeah, so that's referring the most prestigious tournament hosted by the tournament of, uh, by the University of Kentucky. Um, there's several different national tournaments. Um, the Con Tournament of Champions is the most prestigious. And great to see one of our uh, coaches, I think uh, Serena has some students who are on the TOC qualification track, um, her um, speech students. I believe Reese has two or three qualified students. Some of us also help with other schools um, that ha have older programs. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. And I know he'll be taking students this year for Loyola, but in the future, we'll also be doing Able to Shine. I've, I've been really happy to take students several times out to Lexington, Kentucky. It's beautiful out there, best barbecue on the planet. So I, I think the biggest question is Min and Ping, we need to be sure to share. I know we want to answer some other questions, but we need to share 
um, we need to share with our families and every, all of our guests, how to sign up for our boot camps. Um, so I just got a direct question from Ellen. How do you know whether you are able to join the tournament class? So yes, uh, you should be joining uh, our tournament class. So we, because we wanna support the whole child, we require that in addition to the boot camp that just prepares you for one tournament, you either join our public speaking class, especially if you're younger or newer, um, or you join our tournament class if you're older and you finish the public speaking program. This becomes your homeroom where you're doing your regular practice in sports terms. It would be like your workout, your gym, where you're getting your speaking skills in each week. It's a little lower pressure. And then we also have the boot camps for specific tournaments. So Ping, you wanna talk about how they can sign up uh, for our tournaments? Yes, uh, actually I put on my phone numbers in there, my phone number and also uh, our customer's phone, uh, in, customer um, in charge person phone number, which is Lily. So you guys can, uh, can call this number. And also, I think most of the guys are also in the WeChat group and we're going to share our PPTs with you guys, which has the tournament schedules here. And I want to let you know uh, that, you know, coming, I think, uh, you know, uh, in this first half year of 2021, uh, we do have a few tournaments, you know, uh, finalized to to sign up. Uh, I think uh, the first one, I think the first one, you know, uh, this one will be. Um, so uh, in, in the end of this month, we are going to, you know, take the elementary school students to do the speech uh, tournaments uh, hosted by Southern California Junior uh, in the Forensics uh, League. And uh, I think uh, in March, then we're going to uh, take the middle schoolers and also high schoolers to do the debate. So feel free to sign up. Um, but you know, there's some like a, a prerequisites though. You have to be with us, uh, uh, you know, taken us, uh, you know, two sessions of a public speaking class or debate classes, yeah, or something. Yeah, we're gonna do that, introduce that later on. And uh, I think, uh, you know, in April and also in May, we also have a finalized which, um, what kind of tournaments we are going to do, right? So if you, uh, I'm going to share this um, uh, PPT slides with you guys. When you look at this slides, pay attention to the nature of the tournaments. Is it either speech or speech only or debate only? And also who to attend. Some of for summer tournaments, it may uh, you know apply for the middle schoolers or it may only apply for the elementary school uh, schoolers. So pay attention to the information here. Then uh, if you uh, notice, you, if you feel like your kids, you know, they're, is the right age and also there is the right the speech uh, or is, is the right of the right right uh, you know right tournament style which is you know either speech or debate then you figure out this kind of things then you can you can sign up you can talk to Lily uh, our customer in charge person and she can you know direct you to for the following uh, steps okay and so uh, maybe we have some other questions I noticed there's some like a notes there on um, Serena, do we have any other questions from the? Um, I'm going to look through them, but as I look through the questions, if anyone has questions, feel free to turn on your camera, raise your hand, or put them in the chat so that we can answer them for you. Okay. Uh, before, sorry, there's one thing I need to mention that you know, some uh, I noticed some one parent was asking about the prerequisite for the uh, for the boot camp and also tournaments. Uh, there's some requirements here. I think I, I mentioned that in our last workshop. And by the way, we're going to do this uh, parents or uh, a parent, like a debate and a, and a speech tournaments a sharing workshop uh, pretty much on a monthly basis. So just uh, uh, sign up to our or uh, you know, follow our um, notice in the in WeChat group. Okay, so the prerequisites for speech and the debate tournaments, and for the speech tournaments, either you have signed, you, you have taken two sessions of a public speaking, public, public speaking classes. Uh, or uh, four weeks of a spring camps or summer camps, and and also you should. You should be concurrent enrollments, uh, you know, of our current class, and uh, the similar things uh, for the debate tournaments, and uh, you know, at least one session for debate class you have taken, or and one session for public speaking class you have taken, or and the four weeks of uh, spring camps or uh, summer camps. Uh, or, you know, if you done the uh, regular class, then that's fine. If you didn't do the regular class, but you did take our, you know, camps before that, that should be fine too. And plus you are current, in, uh, you know, students for either debate or public speaking class. Either way, it's okay. And, and I think a match, um, so for the speech and the debate tournaments, uh, could you, you know, kind of like educate the, or share your thoughts about, you know, how uh, should the students only, you know, strict themselves to the debate tournaments or they should uh, do both? 
Yeah, we firmly believe that students should be growing their skills in a variety of ways and trying multiple types of events. We're a little bit specialized right now just because we started in the middle of the year and we wanted to make sure we got to tournaments. But um, I know, for example, Aaron's already entered both types of events. Max has entered both types of events. I think Aaron would say, I just want to do debate all the time because that's what he enjoys more. But what you'll see is that we learn a lot from the different types of events. Uh, summer, uh, the other, our other summer also entered a speech tournament as well and had some really great ideas from her oratory that I think ended up helping us in other debate rounds. So Serena, maybe you can talk about how those skills um, in speech help debate. And I could talk about how debate helps speech. And, you know, because we want our, our students to be well-rounded and able to really be very persuasive in a variety of ways. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, for speech, a lot of the focus is on content, but also delivery, as mentioned, by Olivia, there's a good mixture. You have to find that balance. And so in speech, we focus a lot on the little details that you might not notice, such as your eye contact, what are your hands doing, your body posture, your body language, your voice, your volume, your pitch, so many things that students won't notice. And we teach them the foundation of what it means to be a good speaker. Now, when you go into debate, a lot of times debate is more so about like the things you say, you need to persuade. It's not just, I have good delivery. However, delivery is a big part of needing to persuade. If a student has phenomenal delivery, they are looking at you, they are passionate. That is also a factor that will persuade the judge. So when it comes to delivery, there's a lot of overlapping similarities or factors that will help you do better in tournaments. Yeah, earlier today in the quarterfinals at Berkeley, my wife and I were both judging the same round actually. Um, and her and I ended up disagreeing on who won the round. And part of it was even though I really try to only judge the debate based on the content, one speaker had such good ideas, but they were so disorganized mm -hmm. that it was hard to tell where am I even supposed to flow them? There was a question earlier, flowing is note taking and you're taking notes on the most important ideas. And the debater is gonna tell you normally where those ideas should go by doing something we call signposting. But this debater had such good ideas, but they were just all over the place. And in the end, I said, you know, I wasn't sure if you meant this argument to answer their argument or not. And so I can't vote for you. Um, so we, uh, there's a great question, uh, are the, oh yeah, so Ping's answering it in the chat. Are there other organizations? Yes, there are some other great organizations out there. I can't speak to what happens in their training programs, but I can speak to what happens in Able to Shine. And it is really student-centered and focused on the growth of the individual student. You should be taking our training classes as often as you can. Um, once you've signed up for every single Able to Shine class there is, maybe we can talk about making more programs for you. And that's exactly what Ping and Min did this year. 100% uh, uh, the Able to Shine program is, is the best I've worked with in terms of supporting students and staff, uh, really works around the needs of each individual person. Yeah, thank you. Um, could we also have Olivia's mom share a little bit about her experience? Olivia's mom, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hello. Hi, uh, Serena. Hi. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. I was talking to Olivia and then while we are listening to all the speakers. Um, so honestly, the first thing came to my mind is that um, this is definitely not a one-time deal. This is what she is doing is reflecting what she has been doing and the training for four or five years. You know, we have been with um, Able to Shine for quite a few years. Um, and I still remember she when she started at eight years old, she was so new, not knowing many things. So everything started from the beginning, from the basic training and accumulating to now. So that's the first thing I would recommend to other parents. Don't wait and nothing will come out easily. You have to start when, you know, they are young get them into the mood, create the different environment for them to learn and to shine. That's, that's the first thing. Um, the other thing I want to say as a parent, um, I really enjoy the Super. tournament experience. You're muted. Oh, sorry, maybe I um, click on that um, accidentally. So the second thing I want to say is that 
as parent, I really enjoy the tournament experience. I truly believe getting into the tournament and or any competition is a great way to help the kids to grow quickly, to learn quickly, because they were under the pressure. You know, when you are under the pressure, you deliver and you learn fast. You absorb everything you observe. That's number one. Number two is that this is also a way to open their mind because in the competition, they can see so many different competitors. They can learn from other people, not just from their, their internal uh, team, but also from other people. You know, sometimes I feel that, you know, before the tournament, they feel good. But after the tournament, they feel that now I know what else is going on there. I really, you know, um, have lots of room to improve. So that's another very important thing. Um, also, as parent, I think um, the dedicated support to the kids, uh, including, you know, get a chance to be the judge in the tournament um, is a great way for me to learn, you know. Um, it's not that difficult as long as you are willing to put in your time and energy to learn those things. Um, so if you want to encourage your kids to go down this road, um, you should also, you know, put yourself there um, to be more involved and also to, you know, try to attend some tournament as a judge. I can assure you, you will learn a lot. And I know that Able to Shine is trying to put some like a um, public training for parents, you know, so if you get a chance to be the judge later, what can you do? What do you say? What do you write in the comment? Those are going to be great, great value for you as parents, you know, so I truly encourage you to you know, take those opportunities. Don't miss that. So back to you, Serena. Thank you so much for judging um, for our tournaments. That was wonderful having you there. And, and oh, I learned so much from you, Matt. Yeah, oh, good. And we learned from you. The ideas from your speeches also help all of our students. That's where, you know, we say we're a team, but maybe we should really say we're a family. Um, where yeah. the parents, the students, the coaches, we're all coming together and we're spending 12 hours a day together. Um, and we're learning all these ideas from every round someone goes and sees, they come back with other great ideas. Oh, one of our students, this speech idea would be perfect for one of our other students. Here it is. Um, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I also wanted to echo that. I think it's clear how much investment um, Olivia's mom, you have in your child. And it's it's such an amazing experience because it's not just the coach and the student, but it's like coach, student, parent, CEO, um, everyone's involved. Everyone wants everyone to succeed. And it's such a nurturing environment. So I love the encouragement um, that you've given out. And thank you for sharing um, your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? If not, um, here's an opportunity to put one in, but I do have one question that I wanted to ask the students. So again, Summer, Aaron, and Olivia, feel free, whoever wants to answer this one. But from a more general, from a more general perspective, um, I want to know why you guys like, enjoy speech and debate, and maybe even some things you've learned from your experience competing. So what did you learn from the tournaments and why do you like speech and debate? Whoever can start first, anyone. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I like speech and debate, and I think this is also a reason why you cannot like speech and debate, but for me, this is why I like it is that there's really no right answer. So like whatever side you're on, you can debate it the best that you can, no matter what you believe in. And you can almost always come up with the response to anything that the other side says. And I've just noticed that in class when I'm speaking, I use a lot less filler words like like or um, and I'm more eloquent, I would say. Um, and like more than I was before I started able to shine. And I didn't really just notice this like, you know, slowly, slowly, which it did happen. But one day I was like, oh my God, like I've just become a much better speaker because of debate. Awesome, thank you so much. What about Aaron or Olivia? Do you guys wanna share? Um, I like debate because I like arguing with people. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's like a plain way to put it, but uh, so I like the bait because uh, you get to refute the opponent's points, and I 
and usually my mom assigns me a lot of classes and I don't really agree with that sometimes but I know it helps me but I just really don't want to go to classes so I just argue with her a lot and yeah <laughs> Matt did you yes, want to share what Aaron just said made me think of something that we often say about speech and debate is that teenagers like to argue um and arguing is like if you think of a star wars analogy arguing is like the dark side of the force um debating is the light side of the force we want to take those inherent interests in you know really hashing things out and channel it in a positive and respectful way your kids at some point are going to start arguing with you if you'd rather they do intellectual debates um, as ping found out with aaron then send them to us and we will channel their skills and hopefully they will become i was going to say anakin skywalker but that actually the key turned bad so luke skywalker is that <laughs> or um you know and, and we can take those skills and you will see just enormous growth as some's pointed out yeah i can definitely agree to what aaron said when i was younger my parents always said like Oh, like, I think so. You know, why are you always talking back? But I channeled all that energy into debate and it really helped me in college and in life. So I definitely second what they both were saying. All right. Amin, did you also have a comment you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I have a quick comment. I'm, I'm so proud of our kids uh, about. Um, uh, their achievement in the tournament and how they behave today. Really, I'm really, really proud. And I have a piece of information that I want to share. So we have uh, about 120 people who signed up for the for this uh, talk. And so I surveyed a little bit, say uh, asking like, how often do you want to participate in tournaments? And uh, I sampled at about 100 people. Uh, so 15% said once a year, 50% said once a semester and 20% said once a month and 7% said as much as possible. So, uh, I think for, so we can clearly, clearly see that um, most, more about half of the people say about once a semester, but if you are, uh, so if you are seriously considering your kid to be in this, to do this sport, and also it, it is a sport that we're, that is not affected by, by, by the pandemic, um, so we, we don't know how long this will go, but if if you seriously, uh, I think so. I, I think the recommended if you set, uh, set aside the prerequisite, pre pre our philosophy at Able to Shine is uh, we recommend that you rec you go to tournaments say, say once a month because the it is we there are two scenarios. One scenario is okay. I'm gonna prepare one for big big one big tournament for this one semester, and I'm go and I'm gonna go and I want to win. And that's huge pressure, or it you can treat it as a, a as a like when you learn soccer where you have you you uh, have matches every weekend, and then whether you lose or win, it's okay. The next weekend can go again. So one, uh, so having have trying to have them compete once once a semester is actually more pressure than having them compete once a month because now you know it's it's a, it's not an opportunity to to just go and win or to, uh, to compete to win but it's it's an opportunity to, to learn and may, you might lose some but eventually as you go do more and more you will learn from more and more people and it's just less pressure and more fun and more opportunity to win in the end okay thank you Awesome. Thank you so much, Min. Do we have um, any other questions from the audience? There are no bad questions, so feel free to ask. If I heard how to say something. I would also like to thank um, Matt and Ping for helping me through this too. Um, on the on the tournament day, I don't think Gary was available too much, so Matt helped me through a lot of stuff. You're welcome, yeah. Awesome, that was really sweet. I think it's clear that um, you're not really just signing your student up for someone to teach them or lecture at them, but you're signing them up for a mentorship, more of a mentorship, a coach, and I think that's really special. I, and actually, now that you mentioned that, there's students that I coached when I was first an assistant coach 20 years ago that I'm still in touch with that are working at the State Department. Um, you know, you've got someone who's going to help you with college applications to, and resumes uh, to come. 
this is a, can be a lifelong connection. Four of my former students are now debate coaches at other schools. Uh, so it's great to see the ways that this goes on. Can we just do one more reminder of how to sign up for our wonderful tournaments from Min or Ping, please? Yeah, uh, I already posted my information, uh, my phone number, and also my WeChat ID, and also our customer in charge person's uh, contact information there. Uh, her name is Lily, and feel free to you know call us. And also in the WeChat group, um, I think we have a, like a parents WeChat group for the tournaments specifically, and always feel free to contact us. And we are going to send out the, you know the the next round the tournament sign up information uh, to parents as well in WeChat. And so I think we are good for the uh, this uh, the uh, the uh, um, uh, February ones. I think uh, we are still recruiting for enrolling for the March one. So yeah, the March one, I can start. show you the. I think is. Um, that one's boot camp starts next week, I believe. So we want to get those students that are wanted to try public forum debate and Lincoln Douglas debate um, going immediately, and that'll be the novice championship. So really. Yeah, exciting. I think it's this one, right? So, and we are we we may have still have a couple of spots for this, uh, you know, March one. Um, this is about the debate and for the middle schooler and also high schoolers, and the next one will be. Uh, if you if you if you cannot make it for the March, then you can feel free to sign up for the April one. Or you know, uh, you don't have to make a huge commitment to sign up for all the tournaments. Uh, you can pick the ones that you feel comfortable to do and you feel like you're available to do, right? Um, but again, like what Ming said, we strongly recommend you guys to you know do the tournaments on a monthly basis because. Um, it, it will help. It'll help with the kids to win, uh, you know, you know, getting more chance to winning uh, awards or winning something in the bigger tournaments because they need to the practice, right? They need to practice for both speaking or debating and also competition skills. And uh, the only the, the only way for you to, you know, enhance your competition skills is, is to do the tournaments, right? You can only, you know, enhance the, the competition skills without doing the tournaments, then that, that's impossible. So, um, Everything matters. It's the same thing that you do take a kids for the math, for the sports games, and for the other tournaments as well. Um, you know, um, all the practice matters towards the end. Yeah. Okay, well, I have one more comment. So it is, it is not only just to learn speech or debate. It is uh, there are a lot of life lessons in this, and the students can learn like how to win and how to take loss. And I've, I've read in, in another group where uh, they, they're talking about their, their kids, like in high school, they are uh, competing and uh, they lose and then come back and cry. Like, I think our kids after their first, first tournament where they cried after they lost, but uh, as uh, we would, we would prepare, prepare the kids to take this kind of experiences so that you will not need to, you will take the win and win and loss uh, more easily. And another thing is there are many situations that might happen and there are many life lessons that might, might learn that you might learn. Like, for example, there are times where their judges are not are not fair. And how do you deal with it? How do you deal with this kind of situation? How do you uh, like if, if you're a parent, how do you talk to your to your kids about this, this situation? Because a lot of times um, this is life, right? And uh, because this is just a really good opportunity to learn a, a lot of, of um, valuable life lessons. And the reason that I am very confident in recommending our coaches and our team is because I've watched how they handle these situations and how they, how they nurture and how they protect the kids. And I'm very confident that our team is the right team to help you bring, uh, to, to raise your kids the way you want them to grow up to be. Thank you, me. And then Matt, do you want to share a little bit of experience? Like, uh, uh, I think in the Stanford tournaments, a couple of our kids got mistreated uh, by some judges there. And uh, how would you, and how would how we handle that? And how would we, uh, you know, per, or suggest our kids to handle in the next in the next round if they come across some situations like that? How would they speak up? So that's hard. There was a, a it was it was kind of the tournament's fault. There was a, some poor communication before our first parliamentary debate round, and a number of students had prepared for the wrong topic. So you get 20 minutes to prepare, but they had announced two different topics. And in both cases, the people we were scheduled to debate against had prepared the wrong topic. And our students were very generous and, and offered to let the other team have a little bit of extra time so they would actually be able to have a good debate. But in one of the rounds, 
uh, that that judge didn't stop things in time and the other team got to hear our opening speech first before they got their preparation time. And that was really, that was, it was, it was definitely upsetting. In another case, a judge really clearly said that their personal opinion influenced a decision when we want the judges to try to be really unbiased. But in the end, they said, you know, I thought maybe your team spoke a little bit better and made a little more sense, but I already agreed with the other team. So I'm going to go ahead and vote for them. Uh, so this is, Frustrating. I'll be honest. As a as a as a coach, you know, we we want our students to have impartial and and fair judges. But it's also part of life is that not everyone comes in completely unbiased and as a perfect clean slate that we can write our beautiful speech on. So we talked a lot about how do we adjust, or as we call it in debate um, and in speech, adapt our communication based on the backgrounds. How do we talk about talk to the judge about their biases and about their beliefs before the round and the importance of being able to set that aside. And it ended up being a really, I thought, a really powerful conversation we had with our students. And we all came out feeling a lot better that we can't, we're never even the best debater in the world. The best debater in history was a college Lincoln Douglas debater. He won 87 rounds his senior, his junior year, and but still lost two. So sometimes we're still going to have those losses. How do we deal with that in a positive and constructive way and grow from it? And I think as a team, we learned a ton from our losses in Stanford, and that's part of why we won the tournament in the end. Um, we learned how to communicate with judges from a variety of different backgrounds, how to talk about it when something feels unfair in a way that's positive and building everyone up, but also, you know, not letting it go. Um, so I feel like we have the right support team to make sure that the kids are really taken care of and the kids learn how to take care of themselves when they see some injustice and how to speak up in a positive and constructive way. Well said, yep. This is great. Thank you all so much for being here. I, we can't wait to work with, to coach your kids over the next couple of years. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so Serena, do you want to close out the workshop by? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you everyone for taking your time to listen, um, hear our students, their experiences. It was definitely um, such an honor to be able to share with you. And I hope that a lot of the things that were said today that you would take it into consideration. We would love to work with your kids. We would love to help them win. And we're just a group of excited, passionate people who want your kids to grow, become more confident and learn these soft skills. Um, so thank you again. If you have any questions, Ping did leave a bunch of WeChat information and her number down below. So I strongly urge you and recommend that you contact her when you can. All right, so I think that's it for us. Thank you again, everybody. I hope you have an thank amazing- you. Yeah, thank you, Serena. Happy Chinese New Year. Happy Chinese New Year to Matt. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody.